Before we turn to our Bibles, some reflections on the year. 2016 was an interesting year at a number of levels. It was a year of falling stars at one level. To give you a list, Glenn Frey from the Eagles, Muhammad Ali, Gene Wilder, Florence Henderson, David Bowie, even the actor who played Alf. Then on Christmas Day, George Michael. And two days later, the actress who played Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, died. And on social media, people don't make jokes or resort to humor when people die. But at the end of this year, it was near out of hand. People were without words. One friend, okay, 2016, we surrender. You know, it's taken the Princess of Alderaan, almost like the plague, the last plague uh, in Pharaoh's uh, Egypt. We're done. Okay, what do you need? Or another friend. And Keith Richards still walks among us. There are contradictions before us in uh, popular culture in surprising ways. And as if to rub it in our face, the next day, Carrie Fisher's mother, Debbie Reynolds, died. An icon of her own generation and a new personality to me. Well, not everyone will identify with each of these characters in the same way. And no doubt each of us will wonder how anyone identified with maybe one or two of the characters on the list. But nevertheless, these characters represent their generation. They are the voices and the faces of the people. And these are the bright ones. We even call them stars. They shimmer with a kind of glory as the world looks on. The strong ones the beautiful ones, and they're immortalized in their art, their voices and their images frozen in time, in their prime. And at news of a death, I inevitably will rummage around a bit on the internet, uh, whether I knew the personality or not, to learn a bit about them. I may watch some music videos or watch some interviews and often become endeared to the person, often come to see why they shined so brightly to appreciate their talent. And often you discover some shadowy things about these characters, perhaps especially after they left the limelight. In one interview, uh, George Michael lamented a response of people to him over time and the weirdness of being famous. He said as the years went on, you know, a whole generation has grown up with his face in 2D printed on their minds so that when they'd see him in 3D and aging, their responses would get stronger and stranger over the years. Ah, none of us are in quite that position. I don't envy him. And it might explain something of what happened with George Michael. He couldn't keep up with his own glory. And so he died alone and hiding. We're told in one piece that he became recluse because he couldn't bear people to see him. He hated the way he looked. He had totally lost confidence. And even photos released for his last album in 2014 were years older than that. And this, after a 20-year run with drug addiction, depression, and suicide attempts. What is going on? He could face the camera or the crowd with boldness but he could not face the future for he had no hope and therefore he had no confidence or boldness with respect to what lie ahead. His glory was anchored in humanity in, whom, in who he was and who what we made of him. His brightness was actually an illusion. If he shined, it was because we put the spotlight on him or we flashed a camera at him and he shined but the light would leave. And it's not an unfamiliar story. Carrie Fisher was cast at age 19, interviewed in those days. She'd be interviewed as the daughter of Debbie Reynolds. It was not long before Debbie Reynolds was introduced as the mother of Princess Leia. And meanwhile, she too, Carrie Fisher, is going from addiction to addiction across her life. Her glory as George Michael's was the kind that fades. Uh, no, doubt, no doubt, some of these stars fade better and more gloriously than others. But eventually, for all of the stars of this age, the lights go out. 
So for as hard as we try to brighten and lengthen human life, even the brightest and strongest and most beautiful fade and fall. So here's the question. Here is the question for you this morning. Where is a glory that does not fade? Better even, a glory that grows. A glory that gives hope for boldness in the face of the future. And if there is such a glory, where does it come from? How do you know when you've got it? And how do you find it? Open with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You knew we'd go to the Bible for our answer. And this is where we're going. We'll be in verses 12 through 18 this morning. We will look around in the course of the sermon, a number of verses ahead and behind. For context, we'll begin with this. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But... When one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Our author is the Apostle Paul. And in context, he is writing to a church that is enamored with the glory of man and of this world. This church is seeking leaders with cred, with certain letters of recommendation, he mentions, with eloquence in speech and with stature. And Paul didn't have the right kind of connections or presentation, apparently. Not enough Twitter followers. But Paul has an entirely different mind about this. As he'll say, the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen, those things are eternal. And so in this morning's text, Paul is defending his authority as an apostle in connection with the glory of his gospel. And what interest is this defense of his apostleship to us this morning. Well, of great interest indeed. For in our age as well, Jesus Christ, the Bible, and the church do not look or appear glorious to the world's eyes. Jesus Christ is weakness. What else is a man hanging on a cross but weak? The word of the cross preached is folly, and the church is, well, Look at us, clay jars, nothing fancy, really. To the human eyes, these look dingy, unattractive, regressive, and backwards. And believers in Corinth were tempted to prioritize the things that are seen. And so are we. So how does Moses fit into all this? There's a lot about Moses and this veil and all this in this passage. Well, Moses is a point of common ground with his readers. They agree that Moses' ministry was glorious. Moses spoke in person with God. His ministry was incredible. It was glorious. Yet compared to Paul, as Paul will say, but with not these words, Moses' ministry, for as glorious as it was, was small potatoes. Well, the shape of the sermon this morning will basically be the shape of the text, a contrast, beholding the face of Christ and beholding, sorry, excuse me, back up, beholding the face of Moses and then beholding the face of Christ. So first, beholding the face of Moses will be in verses 12 through 15. What is this veil thing all about. 
sort of like the hub at the center of a wheel. We're going to focus on that and look around at the passage through that image. Two questions. What is it hiding and why is the veil needed? Those are the two questions we're after. This morning's text has been a com- called a commentary on Exodus 33 through 34. So let's just go ahead and read parts of Exodus 32 through 34. Turn there with me. And if you have a Bible and you can count to two, then you can get there. It's the second book in the Bible right after Genesis. We'll be in Exodus 33. Moses is on Mount Sinai. This is the second time he's been there. He was there initially to get the law. He came down with stove tablets, found God's people in sin, threw the tablets on the ground in anger, and now he's got to go back and get more. And here he is speaking with God. Exodus 33, 12 through 2012. We'll start there. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Now, if you're like me, when you usually imagine these episodes from Exodus where Moses is on Sinai, you imagine it from the foot of the mountain and you see the whole thing and the smoke and Moses disappears into it. But here we've got a camera right up close on the action, up in the cloud, right in front of Moses and God and a mic picking up the conversation. We're right there. We're taking into the cloud. Moses knows the Lord is his only hope for the people. And he isn't going anywhere if the Lord doesn't go with him. They would have been dead on the shore if God had not part the sea at the Red Sea. And they would have been dead where they stand if the Lord does not go with them into the promised land. And yet there is sin. And so God has said, I won't go. Yet Moses has been told it's too dangerous for the Lord to go with them because of the people's sin. This is after the golden calf incident, as I've mentioned. And the second time they've been on the mountain, God's covenant was broken as soon as it begun. They would be destroyed by his presence. Yet Moses pled with the Lord and he gets an affirmative response in verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses is going to be the answer to his own prayer. How will God go with his people? He will be present with his people through Moses, a mediator. And now Moses asks an exceptionally bold question. Verse 18, please show me your glory. And good thing he said, please. Moses knows what he is asking. He has only recently been given instructions for the construction of the tabernacle. That traveling tent that represented the presence, that was the very presence of God with his people. The little tent that had three sections, an outer courtyard, and then two sections on the inside, a holy place, and then a veil with flying cherubim embroidered, Representing the cherubim that guarded the way back to Eden. Here now guarding the way into the very presence of God. The intersection, which is the Holy of Holies. Into which only one man could enter once a year. And with strict adherence to very particular sacrifices for his sins, for the place, and for the sins of the people. Lest he die. You do not put a man that close to God's glory, to his presence. And expect him to live. Except on God's terms. Moses knows what it is. To ask, show me your glory. But maybe he doesn't quite even fully understand that he really can't get what he's asking for. What will the Lord say? Verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. 
And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face. For no man, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then... I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Moses would get an answer in the affirmative. He would see the glory of God, but only as much as he could handle. Think about a comet, and it has a trail. He is not allowed to look into the fiery center of that comet. But the Lord will allow him to see the very end of the trail of light left by the comet. Now turn over to chapter 34. Just imagine this. Verse 29. When Moses came down from Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Now, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he had removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses and the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with him. That's all for our time in the Exodus. So you can move back to 2 Corinthians 3. That's the background for our passage. Back to our two questions. What is this veil hiding? And why is this veil needed? What is it hiding? Well, it's hiding Moses' face. And what is it about his face? Well, his face is shining. It's glowing. There are times in the Bible when I am glad that we don't have from the Lord an inspired, illustrated Bible, especially as a parent. But there are times when I wish we had an illustrated Bible, inspired by the Lord, even photographs. What must Moses' face have looked like? And then what must the faces of the people who saw Moses' face shining have looked like? It's something to ponder. They saw, he saw the Lord, and so his face shone. The stuff of comic books. But why is it hiding Moses' face? That's our second question. Why is this veil necessary? Why can't he just let it shine? And let the people see it. Well, we get hints. We can gather. Let's start with uh, 2 Corinthians 3.12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face, so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. So that the Israelites might not gaze on the outcome of what was being brought to an end. It's not obvious to me as to what he's talking about. When I read that at first, what does he mean? What was being brought to an end? Well, clearly here he's talking about the old covenant, the whole package of the way that God related with his people through Sinai. The whole thing's a patch, a band-aid, a holdover until the Messiah comes. It was broken as soon as it was given. It can't fix the problem of the human heart. The whole golden calf thing was a whole lot like Genesis 3 in Eden. Moses comes down from the mountain and they have made an animal to worship and trust out of gold. Moses says, what is this? And Aaron says, I threw the gold in the fire and it popped out. Which is kind of like Adam pointing to his wife and blaming her in the garden when God asks him. The hardness of the human heart. Confronted with its sin, it locks up, it defends itself and says, I'm good, I'm good. This is the heart of the problem right here. And we all know it personally. 
Consider what he says in the verses just before. At the beginning of our passage, he started, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. What is that hope? Well, look at verses 7 through 11 with me and watch for a contrast. A contrast between the old covenant given through Moses at Sinai and the new covenant. And if this feels a little needless, like um, a lecture teaching time, extra interesting Bible facts, remember that Paul, in order to reveal to his readers how great and glorious his gospel is, needs to make a pass through Moses. His people need to understand how glorious Moses' covenant was so that they may understand how glorious the gospel is by comparison. So watch the contrast in the effects between the two covenants. Verse 7. Now, in the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze on Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Well, not the ministry of the Spirit had even more glory. For if there was a glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. So count the contrasts there. The old brings death and the new life. Why would the old bring death? Well, that's because the old is of stone. It's stuck on a rock. It can't fix the heart. A tablet with writing and commands and instructions can't get under the surface. It can only speak to it and expose it. Stone versus the spirit. The old ultimately brings condemnation for that reason, but the new through Jesus brings righteousness. The old is visible and concrete, I mean, almost literally, these stones. Uh, But the new is invisible, and it works on the invisible problem of the heart. It's unseen. And the old had glory. There is no denying that. It was glorious. It's just that the new covenant is so much more glorious than Moses' ministry and what he saw as to eclipse it and make it as nothing. Far surpassing it. So what's coming to an end? Well, it's the old covenant and all that that little glow represented. It could not save. But why is the veil needed? Why can't they uh, gaze on Moses' face? Why a veil? In a word, destruction. That's why. Israel is kept alive at this moment by a thread. And that thread is Moses. A very imperfect mediator between the Israel and the Lord. And in the context of our Exodus episode, repeatedly the Lord in anger speaks about the danger of the people in proximity to God. They're stiff-necked and God can't go with them lest they die. The Lord said to Moses, just listen to Exodus 33, 3, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up amongst you lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff-necked people. And this is why Moses is up on the mountain saying, Lord, I can't go in there without you. And he continues, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. And then the whole tent thing, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp. Far off from the camp was the tabernacle. Close enough to communicate the presence of God, but far enough away that God's presence, his glory, would not consume the people because of their sin. So Moses pleaded with the Lord to go with them. But you see, it's dangerous to go into the promised land for Israel without the Lord. But it's more dangerous to go in there with the Lord given sin. And so Moses pleads with the Lord to go with them and God provides a way in which he will go just enough of his presence not to smoke them out. Moses himself will be the answer to his own prayer 
he would be the one to mediate the presence of God. And it would show in his face. This whole thing, though, is very precarious, even if deadly. Moses can look at the afterglow of God's glory, and that's it. He has favor with God. He's a righteous man. He's allowed to see the afterglow of God's glory. But the people aren't for but moments able to look on the afterglow on Moses' face of the afterglow of God's glory. Do you get that? Because of their sin, they can only even stare at the effect of the glory on Moses' face for a time, lest they be consumed. The problem is in their hearts. As Paul will go on to say, their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. And this is the problem. This is the problem of the human heart. That they would have the promises and wonders of God and kick against him and not trust him. It's the nature of our sin. It wasn't going to happen. The fix by stone tablets, those hardened them further. They could expose sin, but not fix it. So here's the point. Here's the takeaway so far from reflecting on Moses' veil. As truly incredible as it was, that is Moses' ministry. Moses' ministry was terribly inadequate. How cool is it that Moses spoke with God and came down and you could see his face glow from having been in the presence of God. And yet that is nothing like what we actually need. It's not even close to a return to Eden where God walked with us. Moses has got to put a veil over his face after a few moments so we're not destroyed by the presence of God in his face. The old covenant doesn't fix the problem of bringing God and humans together. No matter how glorious Moses' ministry was, oh, he's the brightest, one of the brightest, shiningest stars in the Old Testament. And he couldn't fix it. That's what the veil tells us. And thank God, there is another face and another glory. So let's look at the other side of the contrast in our passage. Now, beholding the face of Christ. Verses 16 through 18. Speaking of the spiritual veil over our minds. Verse 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, he is talking about our faces. He is saying God has removed the veil and we stare into the glory of God. Total exposure to God's glory. No destruction. What Moses did in removing his veil when he went into the tabernacle, God does for us. I was in conversation with a friend this past week about the passage coming up for this Sunday and I described Moses and how his face would shine in all this and um, I was like, wait a second, that happened? That's amazing. Where has that been? Uh, You know, there's lots of neat stuff that happens on the pages of the Bible. We need to think about this. How glorious is that? But get this. The whole shining face of Moses thing was amazing, but nothing, and that's the point. Moses would be jealous for what we have. Angels who fly in the presence of God ongoingly long to look into what we have. But don't let that lower your sense of the glory of Moses' ministry. No, no. May the glory of Moses' ministry be as amazing as it was he stood on that mountain and saw the trail of God's glory. Let that heighten your sense of the glory of what we have in the gospel of Christ. Two questions to pull us through this section. What does this unveiling reveal and how is the veil lifted? First, what does this unveiling reveal? 
while it reveals the glory of the Lord. Verse 18, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord. But more specifically, there's a reason this point is called beholding the face of Christ. The glory of the Lord is revealed in Christ. Look at chapter 4, verse 3. Paul writes, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face, the face, the face of Jesus Christ. That is where the glory of God is revealed, the center of the comet. You remember John's gospel and how it opened up. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. It almost sounds like Exodus. No one has ever seen God. You cannot look into my face. But here Jesus makes the Father known. And if we're talking about Jesus' face, then why didn't God give us an illustrated Bible? Well, God's glory was revealed in the face of Christ in person. But don't miss this. There was a real veil over Moses' real face. But that was a parable for the veil that stood that stood between the people and the Lord, the veil that was over their hearts. And now we all with unveiled face behold the glory of God in the face of Christ. Here, the face of Christ is the preached word of God, the gospel, the apostolic teaching. Look at verse five of chapter three. Paul says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse six, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so in the very preaching of the gospel of Christ, by faith we stare into the very comet of the glory of God. And instead of dying, we live. You may remember on the road to Emmaus after Jesus' death and his resurrection, two disciples hung their heads, bewildered at what happened. Now, they had been with Jesus in person and seen his face and heard his voice and heard his teaching about what he would do. And yet they were confused at the whole death on a cross thing, even though Jesus spoke of it. So Jesus opened the scriptures with them and beginning with Moses, he explained to them everything in the scriptures concerning himself. And the text says that their hearts burned within them They were thrilled and then Jesus disappeared. And they didn't even know until he was gone that it was him. Which is to say, they saw Jesus more clearly on the pages of the word of God than they did seeing him in person. Which is why Jesus can say before he leaves to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I leave because I'll send the spirit will lead you in all truth and gives us these scriptures. And so we're looking right here at the page at the word of God, which the word of God tells us is better than seeing Jesus in person as the disciples did. It's the very face of Christ in the gospel as our hearts are made to see the glory of God in him. Long exposure to the word of God does not harden the Christian but renews us. So it's the first of the year. If reading the Bible daily, regularly, has not been a thing for you, make it a thing for you. Uh, Daily, pick it up, chapter a day. Work through John, 30 times in the year, something. Each day in the scriptures, long exposure to the word of God, over time, opens your eyes to the glory of Jesus. Check the blog at the church site. We've got a number of Bible reading plans, if that would be helpful to you and get this as you have long exposure to the word of God Christ preached not only reveals Christ to us 
but Christ is revealed through us, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And so Moses could look on the trail of God's glory and his face shone and the people couldn't even really look on his face very long without being destroyed. Well, we with unveiled face stare right into Christ's face uh, and aren't destroyed. We're preserved, but more than preserved, we're actually transformed by this experience of long exposure to Christ and his word. And staring at the gospel, what are we staring at? What are we reflecting on? except Jesus Christ there on the cross dying for our sins. You know, he was the only one who could go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies because he was perfectly righteous and he needed to offer no sacrifice for himself. There was no problem between the Son and the Father that would keep the Son from exposure to the glory of the Father for he shared in that glory himself from eternity. And yet on the cross where Jesus is dying, he is getting what we would get if we walked in that room. He's getting what would happen to us, utter destruction, if we were that exposed to the very center of the glory of God. And as Jesus dies on the cross and takes that destruction for us, he opens up a way for us to go beyond the veil. It was very expensive for God to provide a way for such stiff-necked people as you and I to stand before him for all eternity with no problem, perfectly safe, and not only that, but being transformed from one degree of glory to another. The, before the sermon, we sang a song with the line, bringing many sons to glory. Recognize that? What does that mean? Does it mean bringing many sons to heaven? or many sons to the presence of God? Well, that line is right out of Hebrews 2, where it says of Christ that it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should be the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. And he became a human in order that he might bring us to glory. And in that passage in Hebrews, it's actually a meditation on Psalm 8 in which God says about humanity that we are crowned with glory and honor. And we do not now reflect that glory, but Jesus Christ reflects the true glory of the image of God in which we were made. And by long exposure to Jesus' glory, we are renewed and transformed into the true humanity that God has made us to be. This is not makeup, this is not lights, this is not cameras, this is not spotlights, and this is not Photoshop. This is the spirit at work to renew us from the inside out so that you and I and Christ's church is beautiful and radiant and shining and shimmery, increasingly so for all eternity. My friends, before we move on to the next question of how the veil's removed, I have to ask you and ask yourself, has this happened for you? Has the veil been lifted? You may not know when it happened, but you'll know if it did. I have a memory from my first Christmas as a Christian. I'd become a believer in the summer of 1995, was invited to church, heard the gospel, and in a matter of time was all in. Uh, with Christ and uh, Christmas snuck up on me now historically Christmases I had remembered maybe two things Christmas songs and Christmas gifts and I cared a whole lot about Christmas gifts my parents can tell you I would cut out a picture of that CD player it was 95 and I would stare at it for months and I would show it to my mom and I would think about the CD player or whatever gadget it was, and uh, I would get it. Uh, or if I didn't get it, I was very upset. I was very invested in Christmas gifts. Now, Christmas songs were just the background music for this, uh, this gift giving that I would receive. 
But this first Christmas as a Christian, it was flipped. I remember my mom asking me uh, what I wanted for Christmas. And I actually hadn't pondered it. It wasn't on my mind. And I had to think about it. And I remember thinking, now that's weird. Because this is always on my mind. And then as Christmas got closer and I started to hear Christmas songs... Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. I believe that. I'd never heard it before. And I started to wonder, what other songs are there out there that that I've been missing out on? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. No, there's nothing there for me. Uh, But joy to the world and a half a dozen others. I was just thrilled. I was singing these songs in church. I'd never done that before. My eyes had been opened. The veil was removed. I was safe in the presence of God and happy to be there. Well, has this happened to you? Well, here's a way to know. Can you face the future without fear? That is with boldness and confidence in the face of death. Do you face today and tomorrow and eternity with the knowledge that the Lord is going with you and that's a good thing and not a bad thing? That's what's going on in verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord, there's freedom. And not just freedom from fearing God's wrath, but freedom to obey him. For that's exactly what they weren't doing there at the bottom of the mountain. When you know the Lord, you're no longer like Israel down there, a veil over their minds, looking to the future with fear and doing their best to hedge against it, making golden calves. They'd prefer to look in the face of a golden statue that they made and trust it than they would to trust the Lord. And that's all of us in our sin. But now in Christ, we're free from fear and for obedience. And hence we grow in radiance as we're transformed into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. And as Christians, we of all people know that we are sinful and have sin. And yet we must say that we are being transformed. The spirit of the Lord is in us. And there are ups and downs with the years, but there is a growing glory. Maybe we see it in each other easier than we see it in ourselves. But a little less like Adam this year and a little more like Christ this year, and all to the praise of Christ for what he does through his spirit. One degree of glory to another. I'm praying for an old friend who's recently left the faith. One of the smartest guys I've known, a great apologist for the Christian faith. He's left the Lord for his sin, and now he's saying things like this. After a lifetime around Christians, I could no longer maintain the belief that the church is something supernatural built by God with Jesus as the foundation and capstone. I mean, who talks like this but somebody who knows their theology? The counter evidence, he says, is too weighty. If Christianity turned out to be entirely false, the church would not look any different. Christians are not people filled with the Holy Spirit. The church is not behaviorally different than any other group that we're told doesn't have God on its side. And my friends, that is not my experience. That is not my experience with me in my own life. And that's not my experience living in this church family among you who are more beautiful with each year and are more radiant with each year, who are not who you were when God saved you. The stories here are wonderful. You may be at the beginning of your transformation. Keep staring at Christ. He transforms. I have no other explanation for what I've experienced or have seen in you. My friend is wrong. Paul sees this too in his own readers. And his Corinthian readers were sort of, you know, I mean, not the greatest Christians. This is a church you might be like, I'm not going back. He begins chapter three. We're beginning to, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. 
And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. Wherever you go, you are proof that God's spirit fixes the problem of the heart and you are being transformed. You are Christ's letter. Instead of words on tablet, we have the Corinthian church. The invisible gospel really does work and they are proof and they and we need reminding. So has this happened to you? And if you're not sure or if you want the veil removed, you want to stand in the presence of God safe, then good news, how is this veil lifted? Our next question, two answers. First, the spirit, verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Verse 18, and this comes from the Lord who is the spirit and if it's not clear who gives life verse 6 the spirit gives life the difference between life and death is the spirit and my own early flickers of christian life uh, in my heart are owing to the spirit of god he did it and he is at work in you to transform but there is another answer to how the veil is lifted verse 16 but when one turns To the Lord, the veil is removed. When one turns to the Lord, it means turning from the glory of this world, from self-justifying, blame-shifting, sin-covering nonsense, to say, I am the sinner the Bible says I am. I cannot stand in the presence of God. And my only hope is the righteous one who can, who died to take away my sins. And through Christ alone, my only hope, I can boldly face the future, even death, knowing that I'll stand in the presence of God safe. To become a Christian is to turn from sin and self and turn to the Lord. And the Lord removes the veil. And guess what? You're not destroyed if you come to him through Christ. This past week, I've rolled an old tune maybe a dozen times. It's a duet from the 80s. I don't know. It just felt like the song for the week by Elton John and George Michael, Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me. It takes me back to the station wagon that my mom used to drive me and my brothers to the grocery store in. It was the mid-80s. Elton John and George Michael The lyric glory was the kind that you get from the spotlight. And when they sang that duet, they were in their full bloom. The flash of cameras brightening their eyes. But they don't look and sound like they did. No one does after those years. But one of them isn't even around anymore. Princess Leia in the famous Jabba scene had to sit up perfectly straight so that no wrinkle could be perceived by the camera. That kind of glory sells and it also fades. It eventually goes dark and falls. But the glory of the Lord on the face of Christ transforms us, you and me, week in, week out under the word, day in, day out in the word, transforms us from one degree of glory to another. And so church, If we have this incredibly, incredible and costly privilege of staring into the face of Christ, something Moses couldn't do, this incredible privilege, what more must we need and what more do we want? Moses was on the mountain and he knew what he wanted, the glory of the Lord. And yet we see it better than he did. And if we have this privilege, what is there to be ashamed of in the cross? It is so weak, but it is our only boast And what do we have to be embarrassed about in the Bible, the preached word of Christ, which is foolishness, but is salvation for us? And what if we had to be embarrassed about the church, which is hardly a perfect people? We are being transformed, and some of us more than others, and some of us perhaps faster than others. All of us clay jars holding this treasure, which is the gospel. Nothing fancy about us, really. With this glory, we may not face crowds and cameras with great approval. In fact, when we face crowds and cameras in the name of Christ, we may very well expect to be disapproved of. It was for Jesus and whose steps we follow. 
But our glory, even if it is unseen, will never fade and it will ever grow. And we can face the future with boldness more than, and in contrast to this world's brightest stars, we face it with boldness because we have hope and a hope that is not rooted in humans, but in the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word where Christ is revealed. A great word for us on this day and a word always needed. Help us this year as we come to the scriptures in a variety of ways to perceive the gospel for what it is and to see the glory of Christ there and to be transformed a little less like Adam this year and a little more like Christ. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.